ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lucas Ford. Thank you guys for having me. I'm really, really I um, flew in from Washington, D.C., and as you know, it's, we started spring on Wednesday, and we um, started it with a snowstorm. And so I'm just so thankful to be back in Florida, um, and I don't take this opportunity for granted. Um, I am especially thankful to be with you all um, because I was born with a number of different disabilities, and I'll share those with you later. Um, but to see what you all have accomplished in life encourages me and have four, three goals, really. Um, first off, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to, to share. And I want to encourage you that no matter what we face in life, we can overcome um, big obstacles on one hand or great challenges on the other. Um, I want to remind you that everything I'm going to share with you all today wasn't by my strength, it wasn't my, by my ability, it wasn't by anything that I did, it was by, because of God. And it was because of a lot of people that believed in me and helped me when I was down or when I was weak or when I had a disability or when I had developmental delay. We all know that this happens, success happens because people get in the boat with us and help us row together, right? I believe to my core, from the very inmost depths of my being, that every single individual, every single creature on the face of this planet is living proof. And there are a number of different definitions that I have come up with that defines what living proof means, what living proof is like. Um, and this isn't an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. But over the course of the next 30, 40 minutes, these are the things I want to share with you all. If we are living proof, we have to encourage and empower each other. We have to believe in the possible when nobody else believes. Uh, we have to be willing to embrace the ABCs of life. We have to be willing to do whatever it takes. Uh, we have to get up each and every time we fall. We can't take ourselves too seriously. Um, and most importantly, if we would be living proof, we have to decide that character is king, okay? So as we launch out, I wanna share you a little bit about my story. I have two moms, um, and my first mom was a very, very courageous teenager who went through a lot of different struggles. Uh, she was 18, 19 years of age, and somehow she got caught up in the wrong crowd, and she got addicted to, to drugs and addicted to alcohol, and I wanna be vulnerable, and I wanna be honest with you all that I've struggled with some of the same things that my mom struggled with. And so, so while some people might call her a drug addict or, or call her somebody that, that, that was the least of these, I call her a hero. Um, and I see her as somebody that made a very, very courageous choice that when she was going through the storms of life, she made a decision for life. And by the grace of God, she decided to keep me. She couldn't take care of me. I was born um, six weeks premature. Um, with, pre with, with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome um, disorder. I was born um, weighing four pounds, six ounces. I went to the NICU um, and was in the hospital for 10 days when I was born because of some of the decisions that she made. And so she couldn't take care of me. And so I was sent to the home of Dorothy Boyce here. Um, and she says this, being an adoptive parent is a life as full as she could ever imagine. And I am so thankful for two moms. One mom that in the midst of a very, very difficult storm decided to push on. And then another mom who wanted to provide a life and provide a home for those that needed it. And so this is me on adoption day. Um, our adoption day is March 17th. So it's St. Patrick's Day. So it's a lucky day in our family. And so my um, um, mom wanted to mix her Irish heritage with my African heritage. And, I like bow ties to this day, so <laughs> if we would be living proof, first thing we have to understand and embrace is to encourage and empower ourselves and each other. And that's what my two moms did. And my mom, over the course of this, I call us the original modern family, okay? So mom didn't just adopt cute, cuddly kids like me, right? She adopted those with disabilities those that had special needs. And so over the course of 15 years, my mom had over 40 foster care children. She adopted six of us. I'm one of her adopted children. She had four of her own um, that were her birth child. 
And then my, um, my stepdad, Larry, came into the scene when I was around eight, and he had three girls. And so we're a large family of 13 right now. But at one point, my mom was the single mom of 11 different children, right? And we came to her with all kinds of disabilities, known and unknown at the time, developmental delay. So my brother Albert, my favorite brother, um, had spina bifida. He was paralyzed from the waist down, right? My sister Leslie, he, he died early in life, so he's passed on. My sister Leslie, she has a um, um, Prater Willi syndrome. And so she has the mind of about a three or four year old, but she's 45 years old. Um, my brother uh, Michael had developmental delay. I came with developmental delay and disabilities. She didn't just adopt children. She didn't just foster children. She adopted those that were teenagers that needed families and homes. So my brother Tim, came to us when he was 16 years old. He was just supposed to come for the weekend for a temporary home and mom decided to adopt him and he stayed in our family. Um, and then we have my, my mom's birth um, brothers and sisters. We have some courageous, my brother Rick was in the um, Gulf War in um, the Navy. My brother Bo was in the Gulf War as well. My mom at one point had two sons serving overseas in a, a theater of war. Um, and had all of us at the same time. And so, again, if we would be living proof, mom told us at a very young age, she um, reminded us of this scripture in Psalms 139 that says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. So if you fast forward to 2018, if I could define that in a better way, it means we're built for something more. Every single one of us, it doesn't matter who we are or what we're born with, disabilities or abilities, we are built for something more. And if we would be living proof, if we would overcome great obstacles on one hand or achieve great aims on the other, we have to believe in time and space and first and foremost that we have to encourage and empower each other. But then we have to leap to that next, that next step, which means that we are built for something more. And if you believe that you're built for something more, when the storms of life come, when the tornadoes come, when the hurricanes come, when the times of disappointment and sadness come, you can get through those times because we believe we're built for something more. We also have to believe in what's possible. We have to have faith. No matter what we see in front of us, we have to believe that things can get better if we're willing to try, if we're willing to work together to be together and all be in the same boat together, rowing in the same direction together, we can achieve great things. One of my favorite quotes comes from Robert F. Kennedy who said, there are some people who will see things as they are and they will ask why. Others will dream things that could be and ask why not. In other words, there are some people in this world that will see the shootings, they'll see the violence, they'll see the hatred, they'll see the division, they'll see all of the things that cause us to shriek from the opportunity of the moment. They'll see the bad things that happen, they'll see the monsters, they'll see the bad guys and the bad girls, and they'll use all of these things as excuses to shrink from the opportunity of the moment, and they'll walk away. But then there are others, others who believe in the possible, others who are living proof, who will see all of the bad things, all of the storms, the shootings, the hatred, the division, and they will still dream things that can be and ask why not. And I'm so thankful. I had a mom that at a very young age taught all of us in our family, whether we were her birth children or we weren't, to believe in what was possible. And when I was 18 years old, I was getting ready to graduate from high school. Mom pulled me aside for one of her fireside chats, right? It was one of those serious moments. And we all know about graduation and, and, and when we kind of like to want to party, right? You want to turn up, you want to have fun. Mom yanked me aside and said, we're going to have a serious chat, okay? And she said, the same questions that I want to offer to you all. She said, Lucas, what's next? What do you want to be? What do you want to accomplish? And how are you going to get there? All of us have different goals. All of us define success in different ways. And so I would offer to you a question I'd like for you to think about. As you come back to this weekend and you think about the successes of the past, I want you to look towards the future. I want you to think about what's possible, and I want to ask you the same questions my mom asked me as an 18, 19 year old. What's next? What do you want to accomplish? How are we going to get there? Okay? Now, 
I grew up in the 90s, and a few things were popping in the 90s. Um, Bill Clinton was president, and Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls reigned the earth, okay? Those are the only things that mattered to me, all right? And so mom asked me this question, and I can remember as a 16-year-old going to Washington, D.C. for the very, very first time. This is Senator John Ashcroft giving us a tour of the Capitol. As you can tell, I'm standing up. I am the only one that cares about what he's talking about, right? But that night we went to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, wow. the most powerful symbol of democracy on the face of the planet. When world leaders come to America, they come to this place because it's a special place that represents democracy, that represents the good things of the earth in the midst of a lot of bad. And I can remember going up to the fence. I didn't try and jump over the fence, right? I went up to the fence and I stuck my, my face to the fence and I said, one day I want to be on the inside. And so I told my mom, when she asked me this question, I said, I want to work at the White House, okay? And I'm, six, I'm 18, 19 years old, of age, have no clue what the odds of this are ever happening. So uh, we just finished the presidential election and any president, Democrat or Republican, will take about 3,000 of their best friends to Washington with them. Of the 3,000 best friends they take to Washington with them, maybe 500 to 700, maybe 1,100 ever get to work at the White House. And there's maybe 360 million Americans. So the odds of this ever happening for any one American is pretty, pretty small. But that didn't matter to a young boy whose mom told him to dream and to believe in what was possible. There was this um, movie that came out in 1997 called Air Force One. Right, Harrison Ford, Russians took over the plane, he got the plane back. It was a fun movie. The first time I ever saw that movie, was I was on the front row of the movie theater the night that this movie came out. Um, and I used to watch Bill Clinton walk, bound off Air Force One and do this wave and all that kind of stuff. And so I told my mom, Mom, I want to work at the White House, but I also want to fly in Air Force One. Right? So the 500 to 1,100 people that ever work at the White House, the number of people that ever get to fly with any president, Democrat or Republican, is even smaller, maybe 25 to 30 at any given time, right? The president, as you know, has his own um, apartment on the plane. He has his own bathroom on the plane. They have two kitchens on the plane. There's a communication center. The plane can refuel in midair. It can fly around, fly halfway around the world without refueling. Um, so what I'm trying to tell you guys, this is not Southwest or JetBlue that Daryl had me fly in on. Uh, and if you've ever seen that show on MTV called Pimp My Ride, this is about as pimp as you get in the sky, okay? <laughs> this is a flying castle, okay? And it's a special, special plane, and it is, in and of itself, a great symbol of democracy all over the world. When people see Air Force One come in, they know that America is there, right? And so it didn't matter to me what the odds were because I had a mom that taught me to believe. And we had teachers, we have teachers, we have people that have been in the boat with us from a very young age that have taught you all to believe in what is possible. And so I told my mom, Mom, I want to work at the White House. I'm going to fly in Air Force One. And as you all can tell, I'm about five foot six on a good day, right, with shoes. And so I had no grand illusions about being an NBA star. But Michael Jordan is a person that was a great inspiration to me growing up. Because he was, as a lot of us are sometimes, uh, cut from the team that we want to be a part of. And so he tried out for his high school basketball team. The very first time he tried out, they said, you know what, you're not good enough. And he went on to become the greatest player in his generation. Every championship um, series that he played, he got six championship rings. And he is one of the greatest players in the NBA and the greatest NBA players in all of history. But he wouldn't have been that if when they told him he wasn't good enough, he gave up. Again, some people will, believe, will see things as they are and they will ask why. Others will dream things that could be and ask why not. And so I had no grand illusions about being a Michael Jordan, but I knew that there was more to what you saw on the court. And so I told my mom, we grew, I grew up in Independence, Missouri, and the closest team to us was the Chicago Bulls. And so I grew up being a wonderful, wonderful fan of the Chicago Bulls. And so I said to my mom, I wanted to work for the Chicago Bulls. So if we would be living proof, we have to encourage and empower each other. We have to believe in what is possible, but we also have to understand that it's about the ABCs of life. There are tons of people all over this country, all over this world, that are trying to get it right. There are good men, good women that are trying to get it right. But it seems to me, in some cases, or in a lot of cases, 
that most of us are trying to get our doctorate, we're trying to get our master's degree, and we really need to go back to kindergarten and just focus on the basics. So I want to tell you a quick story. I met a person by the name of Teresa Carter at the corner of Church Street and Division. If you've ever been to Amway Center down in, in Orlando, that's where the corner of Church Street and Division is. And this is where I met Teresa Carter, okay? And Amway Center is right here. I was just going to the bank to get some cash out of the ATM, and all of a sudden there's this woman in front of me and she says, can I give you a gift? And now she was a person that was experiencing homelessness. I thought she was gonna ask me for a few bucks, right? And so I said, sure, kind of scratched my head internally. I was like, what's this going to be about? And she wrote on it. I don't have the original piece of paper, but I have it at home because I wanted to preserve it. She has what she calls the ABCs of life. And when it seems like things are really, really hard, that's the time when it's time to go back to the basics, when it's time to go back to kindergarten. And she um, didn't just read this for me. She recited this in perfect memory for me, and I want to read it to you, all right? And I'll send this to Daryl afterwards so you all get a copy, okay? It's called The ABCs of Life. And she said, Lucas, can I give you a gift? And in perfect memory, recited this. A, achieve your every dream. B, believe in the power within. C, consider other people's feelings. D, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. E, exalt the Lord at all times. F, focus on heavenly things. G, get wisdom and knowledge by listening. H, hope and happiness depends on you. I, inspire others by the way you live. J, justification belongs to the Lord. K, kind words cease anger. L, love one another as God loves you. M, the more you give, the more blessings you receive. In, no one can change you but the Lord. O, open your heart and mind to new ideas and different horizons. P, put on the full armor of God. Q, quit procrastinating. R, rest in the fullness of the Lord. S, stand strong in your faith. T, trust the Lord in times of trouble. U, United we stand, divided we fall. V, vision is as far as you can see. W, walk by faith, not by sight. X, excel in everything you do. Y, yield not into temptation. Z, zero in on your goals. And then she, um, ASAP, always say a prayer. And she said, written by Teresa Carter, and it was inspired by God to her on February 24th, 2009. And she, in perfect memory, recited this for me. And then she wrote to Lucas and then gave me the original piece of paper it was written on. And then she just disappeared. If we would be living proof, sometimes it's not about trying to get the A or getting the master's degree or getting the doctorate or trying to figure out some complex problem. Sometimes it just is as simple as going back to the basics. And in this year, as you fast forward, as you launch into April, into May, into June, as I send this to you, these are fun to try and memorize because it's, you can memorize it by the A and then go the A and the B and the B and the C and the C and the D and the D. But focus on the basics. When everyone is clamoring for your attention or, or, or when the, the test is stressful or when life is stressful, go back to the basics. If we would be living proof, if we would overcome great, obstacles on one hand or achieve great aims on the other, we have to be willing sometimes to just go back to the basics. And also, you've got to be willing to do whatever it takes. Sometimes that means a little, sometimes that means some, and sometimes that means a lot. My favorite, um, one of my favorite people on the earth is Pat Williams. He's the co-founder of the Orlando Magic, and I was in his office one day and I asked him about leadership. And he said that a good leader knows that at the end of the day, it's not about them at all. It's about the positive difference they can make in the lives of others. A good leader leads from the front and not the back and is willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done, okay? Now, I wanna tell you a quick story about how this is, came true in my life. I was blessed to be in Guatemala in March of 2007. And it was my job to make sure this entire town square 
was filled with people. For the president of our country and the president of Guatemala, we're going to helicopter in and they were going to visit all these people. Okay? And everything was going great. Everything was going according to plan. Um, but there were a few little hiccups. Okay? The first one was there had been a civil skirmish in this region of the country. And so the people in this region of the country didn't really get along with the police of that region of the country. Kind of like some of the same of the, the unrest that we have in this country, right? And so for a presidential visit, you have not just the police of that country, but you have our secret service, you have our military, all on roofs with guns pointing into this town square to keep the president safe, right? So it's not the most hospitable place for a lot of people to gather, okay? Then you have the other thing. We, this, we're in a foreign country. Um, I know a little bit of Spanish, but not a lot. And the secret service agents... Their goal is, uh, is to just keep the president safe, right? And so they decide at the last moment with about an hour left to try and get all these people in here that they were gonna have one checkpoint into the city. And a checkpoint means it's a big magnetometer, which is a big kind of contraption that you have to walk through and you can't take any metal through, kind of like going through the airport. And everyone that goes into the town square has to walk through this thing, right? It takes a long time, okay? Now there's supposed to be three, which would be enough, but they went down to one because they wanted it to be more secure, okay? So they only care, the Secret Service only cares that the president doesn't get shot, which is their job, okay? My job is to make sure it's a really cool event and there's lots of people there. So I'm sweating bullets, okay? I'm concerned that I'm going to lose my job because this isn't going to look well. And so this is where doing whatever it takes hits the road, where the rubber hits the road, right? And so in broken Spanish, we and my friends that were in charge of this event walked through the town square and walked and just tried to invite people, tried to get as many people in the line as possible. And this is where doing whatever it takes um, means something. Sometimes doing whatever it takes means you've tried to do everything possible, you've done all the plan, and sometimes you just have to look up and you have to ask God for help. And that's what I did this day. I was going to lose my job if this didn't go well. And so in broken Spanish, I'm walking through the town square, but I'm also praying to my God in heaven that he would just help me because I didn't want this to go bad or go, go badly. And this is what he did. In an hour, we were able to get all these people into the town square, okay? You could see the president is like, this is, there, there's a little barrier there. You can see the president, they were so excited that they pulled him into the crowd. You can see him, he's playing Superman there. The, the Secret Service have to grab him by his belt and pull him back so he's not doing crowd surfing. This watch, um, at the end of the event, was no longer on his wrist. So <laughs> he lost his watch, but I kept my job. The lesson is this. Sometimes you'll do all the planning, you'll do all the studying, but then you have to do whatever it takes. And sometimes the it and whatever it takes is just looking up and asking God for help. I'm living proof that that happens. And I know that in a lot of our lives, when we pray and we ask God for help, he's willing to help us. If we would be living proof, if we would accomplish great aims on one hand or achieve or overcome great obstacles on the other, sometimes we just have to be willing to stop and look up. All right? And also we have to be willing to get up each and every time we fall. Pianist Duke Ellington said that life has two rules. Rule number one, never quit. And rule number two, always remember rule number one. Okay? So I remember um, just a few, few historic references for you. George Washington lost the first five battles of the Revolutionary War. If he gives up, what happens? Beethoven, his teacher said he, would, he was a dunce. He'd never learn how to play the piano. Uh, Thomas Edison over 10,000 times to try and invent the light. Walt Disney had no formal education. He went bankrupt two, um, seven times, I think, and had two nervous breakdowns, but he refused to quit. And then I shared with you about my beginning in life. I was born premature with developmental delay. And when I got to kindergarten, I got through the first year of kindergarten, and my mom came to me after that first year, and because of the disabilities and because of the developmental delay, I had to repeat kindergarten. And that was my very first experience with a setback and with a disappointment. And I can remember all my friends are going to first grade and I'm standing still. Um, and that was also mom's first time to encourage me with her two keys to success. The first one is if we're willing to all be in the same boat together, if we're willing to think and if we're willing to try hard, 
we can do any things we put our minds to, right? That was her first key to success. I was in um, Alfonso Jackson, he's the former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under George W. Bush. And I was in his office one day and he lifted up his pant legs and he showed me the scars that were left from dogs. He was a person that marched for civil rights in the 60s. And he had fire hoses unleashed on him, he had dogs unleashed on him. And he said, Lucas, you'll have lots of ups and you'll have lots of downs. And you guys can probably attest to that too. Life's full of lots of ups and lots of downs, right? But he said this, if you can look up, you can get up. And no matter what the difficulty is, no matter what the storm is, no matter what the circumstance is, if we're willing to always get up each and every single time we fall down, that's where success happens. That's where meaningful success happens. That's where long lasting success happens. If we're willing every single time there's a difficulty, every single time there's a tough circumstance, every single time there's a storm, if we're willing to get back up and keep walking, that's what makes us living proof. If we would be living proof, if we would overcome great obstacles on one hand or achieve great aims on the other, we have to be willing to get up each and every time we fall. And I told you guys what my dreams were. One was to work at the White House, one was to fly in Air Force One, uh, and one was to, to work for an NBA team, or work for the Chicago Bulls. And I am, and again, this is one of those things where I'm telling you the things I'm sharing with you, again, you know, we have all have disabilities, so this couldn't be me, right? This was someone above me that made all these things happen in my life. And so you can see me, this is in the Oval Office, um, and over the course of four or five years, I was able to serve former President George W. Bush. I was in charge of African American outreach. So anytime um, an African American event or his chief liaison to people like the NAACP or to the National Urban League. Um, and then I was also in charge of professional sports outreach. So whenever you see the president on TV with a jersey or football with a winning team, those were my events that I got to put together. And over the course of all of that, I was in charge of 10 states from Missouri to California. So anytime the president went to one of those states, I was in charge of his trip, which meant a lot of long hours, but it also meant I got to fly with him on Air Force One, right? So this is on our way to Nebraska. Um, this is the very first time I was on the plane on the second anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. Um, and I don't know where this one was taken, I just needed proof I was on the plane. Um, so, not doing any work there, this is more of a staged picture, um, but some people will see things as they are and they will ask why. Others will dream things that can be and ask why not. And this is me, uh, courtside with the Orlando Magic, and for eight years I was very, very blessed to serve just down the road from you all, um, doing community outreach, trying to help people. One of my, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things to do was to be able to provide tickets to a family or tickets to somebody that was in foster care or, or had been adopted that would never be able to afford the ticket for an NBA game. And those are the types of things I love doing. It was a wonderful organization that does so much for our community in the seven county radius. Again, some people will see things as they are and they will ask why. Others will dream things that can be and ask why not. Real quickly, um, the other thing is in this life, Sometimes we can get a little serious, and there's two sides to this coin. On one side of the coin, we must always remember to be humble. Always remember that in whatever we do, that we're serving other people, and that this is not about us. This is about people around us. This is about the greater good. And on the other hand, sometimes this life can be really stressful. <laughs> sometimes there's a lot put on us and a lot of pressure put on us, and we can't take ourselves too seriously, right? And so real quickly, this was my very first trip um, big trip on Air Force One. Uh, it was right after the former president, two presidents ago, last State of the Union address, and we went to four states. We flew out to California, down to Las Vegas, Nevada, up to Colorado, and then we were going to finish this three-day trip, 12 different events in my home state of Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, So I'm living my dream, literally, but I'm taking myself way too serious. I got this scowl on my face. I have this, I got my, of course, I still have a briefing binder all the time. So I'm going around trying to make sure everything's perfect and everything's correct. And I'm missing the magic of the moment, right? And on the last leg of the flight, last leg of the trip, we're flying from Colorado to Kansas City, Missouri. And I walk into the conference room. This is the conference room on Air Force One. And um, my boss is sitting in this chair and I sit in the only chair that's available, it's this chair. 
and I open up my briefing binder and I'm taking myself way too seriously and I'm saying this is what we're gonna do tomorrow morning. We're gonna get up, the president's gonna sign this bill, we're gonna have breakfast with some business leaders, he's gonna give a speech on the economy, then we're gonna do this political event. And in the midst of sounding way too important, in the midst of sounding and taking myself way too seriously, the president walks in the door, everybody in all these chairs look up, they look at him, and they look at me, and then it's at that point I realize I'm sitting in the president's chair on Air Force One, okay? <laughs> so my blood drains from my face, right? Your heart starts beating really, really fast. Your adrenaline kicks in. And I looked at him and was like, this is my very first trip. Nobody told me not to sit in this chair ever, right? And so I look at the president and say, sir, I apologize. I didn't know this was your chair. And he kind of gives me one of those what the hell looks. Uh -huh. Like, you know, this is January of 2008. President Barack Obama then Senator had just won the Iowa caucus, so maybe what was going through his head was, I know that there's a guy that kind of looks like you, a lot taller, running for this job, but I'm president for another year, right? So again, I, I, I try to get up, he's like, don't worry about it, I'm not staying. And he turns around, he starts to walk out, he stops, turns back around, gives me what he cocks his head, and he's like, and I'm like, sir, I apologize, I didn't notice your chair, and he's like, don't worry about it, it's fine. It's just the president's chair. Everyone else starts laughing, he laughs, walks back to his office, and I get up and walk back to the junior staff cabin and sit in the chair I'm supposed to sit in, right? So the next day, um, my parents, my, my dad's Larry, and my mom's a librarian in, in Independence, Missouri, never in a million years could they afford to go to one of these big political events. It's thousands of dollars to get a picture with the president, but because I was in charge of this big trip, they asked me to invite my parents for free, right? Again, taking myself way too seriously. Motorcade stops in front of the house. I go find mom and dad. Haven't seen them in like six months because when you're working in DC, you don't go home a lot, right? And I shake my dad's hand. I was like, dad, your tie's straight. Mom, you know, hair's good, lipstick's good. Serious moment, don't embarrass me, right? And I start to walk away and the White House staff, who know a little bit about the story I've shared with you all, push me back in line and say, introduce your mom and dad to the president. And so again, I straighten up my tie and say, Mr. President, this is my mom and dad, Dorothy and Larry. Gets a big old smile on his face and he puts his arm around my mom, right? And he's like, this is like, this is Lucas's first big trip. You know, we've gone to all these different states. He's done a really great job. You guys have done a great job of raising him. Then he looks at me and gives me this wink. He says, the only thing about your son is he likes to sit in my chair in Air Force One, right? So he rats me out the next day <laughs> to my parents. But the lesson is this. Again, we have to be humble on one hand and not take ourselves too seriously. This was his chair. He's the president of the United States. You're not supposed to sit in his chair. But the way he handled it was a real lesson to me in how I handle it. And then the, the lesson for us is how do we respond when people sit in our chair? How do we respond when people push us, people aggravate us, when people do bad things to us? This wasn't a necessarily bad thing, but how he responded to somebody totally breaching protocol is really instructive in how we should respond to people that breach our protocol, that breach our personal space. How you respond to the person that hacks you, right? How you respond to the person that talks bad about you behind your back? How do you respond to the person that pushes you or that makes fun of you because of the disabilities that we might have? How do you respond? How he responded with laugh and not taking himself too seriously is how I try and respond. And it's a hard lesson and it's a lesson I seek to try and learn every single day. But if we would be living proof, if we would achieve great aims on one hand or overcome great obstacles on the other, we have to be willing to be humble. We can't take ourselves too seriously. Okay? One last story and then we'll let you go to the rest of your weekend here. The very, I told you my mom's first key to success. In the boat, we have to remember that we can do everything, do all things, we can do anything that we put our minds to collectively if we do it together. Individually, not so much. But together, if we're all in the same boat, we can accomplish really, really big things. The second key to success that my mom said was to represent honor, faith, and decency. She said to remember who we are and who we represent. And for me, that means God, but that might mean something else for you all. But we can all agree that good is good and that we should all try and be as good as we can all the time. Dr. King said it this way. He said that whatever affects one of us directly affects all of us indirectly. He says that I can never be what I ought to be until you are who you ought to be. So what happens to you happens to me. If you guys are hurt, I'm hurt. If you guys are in need of something, I'm in need of something because we're all in this together. Character is king and if we would be living proof 
we have to remember in time and in eternity that whatever affects one of us directly affects all of us indirectly. One last story, and I'll let you guys go, okay? It was Monday, March 25th, 2002. I was 22 years old. I was an intern, the first intern class after 9-11, um, and I was randomly picked for a photo opportunity on the south lawn of the White House. The mansion's right there, the Oval Office is over there. Um, and I was on the lawn with a bunch of kids. They were 8, 10, and 12 years old, okay? And I was 22. I'm short. I look really young. So I was kind of concerned that they were trying to pass me off for one of these kids, right? <laughs> Nobody told me that this photo op was going to be with the president. And then he kind of comes out of the Oval Office, and he, I kind of, you know, the kids are kind of like, who is this? And so I just, president, so I get him in line, and they're shaking his hand. He gets to me last, and he sticks his hand out, and he says, hey, I'm George. I kind of knew that, right? Um, but I was born and raised in Independence, Missouri. It's a show me state. Um, and never met anybody famous in my entire life, except for my mom's, right? And so I kind of stuck my hand back out, shook his hand, and said, what up? I'm Lucas, OK? And so for like 10 to 15 minutes on the South Lawn, um, he didn't really have a lot in common with the 8, 10, 12-year-olds, so we just kind of started talking. He's like, where do you work? What are you doing? You know, I asked him about, um, there's a putting green. He's like, you, do you golf? He's like, I used to all the time, but since 9-11, I don't golf at all, and I won't golf until I'm not president anymore. Um, and then afterwards, after this official, it was official photo op with Parade Magazine, um, I kind of started to walk away, and he called me over for this photo. And I would never do this today. You can tell I was really, really excited, so I pour him one for the brother hug, right? And he kind of leans into that, like a real tight smile, like, what the hell is this kid doing? <laughs> and I shake his hand again after this, and this is, again, six months after 9-11. We just had one of the worst terrorist attacks on our country in, since 1941, okay? Pearl Harbor. And I shake his hand and I say, sir, I'm praying for you. The cause is just. And I think that's it. Just a really cool day on the South Lawn. I go back to my desk. I call my mom. I'm excited. I just met the president. I think it's a really neat thing. I'm going to finish this internship, go back and finish college and go be a lawyer, right? Because we need more lawyers, I guess. Um, the next day, my boss comes back from a meeting with the president in the Oval Office and he kind of scratches his head. He says, Lucas, you kind of made an impression on the president yesterday. And of course, my mind went back to pull him in for the hug. I say, I apologize, I didn't mean to pull him in for the hug. And he's like, don't worry about that. He called me over after this meeting. And he said, um, hey, I met this guy in the South Lawn yesterday. What's his name again? He's like, well, that was Lucas. It's like, well, I really enjoyed meeting him. What's his story? And my boss at the time, Ed Moy, um, who was the director of the US Mint, so he's in charge of printing all the money, um, shared a little bit about my background that I've shared with you all about growing up in foster care, being adopted, um, and then being a, a White House intern. And the president did something that is the principal reason that I could stand before you today and share all of these stories. He said, well, what can we do for him? Let's bring him on board. All right? I share this last story for two reasons. Number one, um, it defined character for me. And the, this is not an original definition to me. But I define character this way, that you know the true character of a person by how they treat the person that can do nothing for them. How do you treat the person that can't get you a job or can't get you um, any type of leg up or any type of advantage? How do you treat that person? You know the true character of a person by how they treat the person that can do nothing for them, right? Character is king. And if we would be living proof um, we have to believe that character is king. We have to encourage each other. We have to not give up. We have to be willing to do whatever it takes. We have to believe in what's possible. Um, I want to end with these words uh, for you. Um, and it's just a living proof anthem that I've wrote that I hopefully it will be an encouragement to you. Of perfect creation on one hand and an imperfect nature on the other, of this we are living proof of incredible generosity in one moment, in the height of selfishness in the next, of this we are also living proof. On our best days, discipline feeds the seed of potential that yearns to grow in our hearts. And on our worst days, the seed is choked by the weeds of pride, our own wisdom, and our own smarts. But we still proclaim that living proof is our aim because we recognize and embrace that we are kings and queens, we are paupers and peasants, we are great, and we are small. In moments both good and bad, yes, and every moment all, even in this moment, some of us are up and some of us are down. But the call to be living proof compels us to move forward and claim our crown. Why, you ask? Because I believe we are sons and daughters of a king. 
And in our resources, and then in his universe are the resources of the universe and the ability to understand every truth. And with every morning sunrise, our human search and spirit is made brand new. Why? Because we're perfectly created. Why? Because we are living proof. We are living proof of God. We are living proof of grace. We are living proof of that runner, the athlete that runs with all their heart to, run the, to win the race and then stumbles and falls flat on their face. Does the athlete stay on the ground when the world presses in and laughs? Is the athlete paralyzed when enemies run over them and snort in derision as they pass? Does the runner crumble when friends pretend to help but in reality treachery and deceit they mask? Do we react in the moment, give up, walk away and say what's the use? Or do we respond by dusting off, getting up, pressing on and trying to make our dreams come true? Do we rise up? Do we rebuild and show the world that we are living proof? Yes. Yes, we must run our race and every single day we must get up, we must keep going, running, and we must continue to trust that the end of this life will not be failure, will not be sadness, will not be darkness, and will not be rust. It is not the opportunity or the struggle, disappointment or achievement that will define you at the last. It's whether you strive continually to make sure that the darkness of our past stays in the past. It's how we respond to mountains high and valleys low. It's whether we learn the lessons, embrace the process, and continue to grow. Will your mindset be to look up? Will you always seek to build? Will we stop being our own worst enemies into old habits and grievances? Will we cease to yield? Will we run the race before us? Believe that we are bound for greater things. Will we acknowledge that we're human, but never give in to that false story that people say that we should be ashamed? So at the last, when all is said, when all is written, and when all is done, they will ask you how you kept running, falling, getting up. They will ask you how you won. They will wonder why every time you tripped, you got up after every fall. And they will wonder how you break through every obstacle, every challenge, and every wall. But you, you won't wonder because you know this to be true. We're human. We make mistakes. We have disabilities. But with God's grace, we are also living proof. Thank you. Well, Lucas, this is from the Alumni hey. Association. Thank you so this much for doing <laughs> Thank you. It's only the best of you. Um, I appreciate it. I mean, it was, it was amazing. I think mm -hmm. everyone has a story, and I think this is something to everyone has a story. really right. like follow and gave me encouragement. Looking back there, as I'm sitting down, I was like, well, all right. I need to get up there and run it. Yeah. Get going a little more. Cool. Um, but I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks for listening, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you.